Dinosaur. The very word evokes a nightmare, a nightmare both repulsive and mesmerizing. What is the enduring appeal of these great beasts who lived millions of years before man? Is it the ferocity of their life or the mystery of their death? Perhaps we are drawn to them by the safety of time. As a pundit once said of dinosaurs, they're big, they're mean, and they're dead. Years before we went to Jurassic Park, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle took us to the lost world. Doyle, already internationally famous for creating Sherlock Holmes, was looking for a new kind of mystery. He found it high atop an isolated plateau deep in the Amazon jungle. Here in a tropical wilderness where time had stopped, he conceived of a phenomenon of nature that bewildered science, yet enthralled the imagination. The novel was written in 1912, but the story begins before the dawn of man. Come back now with alien voices, for as you'll hear in this live performance, Conan Doyle's prehistoric adventure is anything but elementary. Extra, extra, read all about it. <laughs> Daily Gazette scientific mission approaching deadly rapids. Extra, extra, read all about it. Everybody, hold on. Find the boulders. Paddle with the colonel and watch out for that tree. It's a whirlpool. Throw from the other side. I am, I am. Top it out. Go with the colonel. I am. Uh-huh. Let it take you. Oh, look, it's working, it's working. Look out ahead. Surface. We hit something. Yes, oh. it's just a glancing blow. Head for there. Jolly, get the right. Get off, push it off. There, 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 there. there you go, there you go. Go with the colour. We're going to capsize. We're going to go. Oh. Oh. Mr. McArdle, it's the telegraph room. Malone's latest story has them in mortal danger. What? Give me that. Hello, McArdle. They what? The rapids. Well, how, how many were hurt? Never mind that. Bring it up here, right away. Uh, and Sir George Beaumont wants a word with you. Oh, you made Sir George walk all the way up here. Well, I couldn't stop him, Mr. Mm. McConnell. He's a... What mm. are all these expenses, Angus? Oh, Sir George, please come in. See here, McConnell. If I wanted to feed Brazil, I'd have formed a charity. It's Malone's next story, Sir George. Not thrown away on some foolhardy scientific expedition up the Amazon. It's our Malone, Sir George. His latest dispatch has just arrived. More Silly bird watching reports. Rapids and cannibals with drums and poison arrows and piranha fish and. Monsters, man, you promised me monsters as big as our headline. Big rapids, big drums, and big cannibals with big poison arrows. And big expenses, my big expenses, and what's this getting me? All my newspaper. My respect. Sir George Beaumont and the Daily Gazette are being praised from Westminster to the West End. Why, I hear the Royal Geographic Society is talking about honoring you. Even the other newspapers are saying what a magnificent contribution you are making to science, funding the expedition that'll find the lost world. Well, I believe it when I read it, Angus. I don't know whether you're the best editor in the business or just the best talker. <laughs> How'd you bewitch me into writing the checks for this wild goose chase? Well, if you recall, Sir George, it all began when young Ned Malone decided he was tired of chasing fire engines. Oh, yeah. Mr. McCardle, do you have a minute? Come on in, Malone. What's on your mind? I've filed my copy, sir. If I could well, just... Well, that's good work, then. I can always count on you to be right on time. Well, it was hardly what I call a difficult assignment. Uh, Couldn't you a just... A good newsman has to cover whatever happens. A formal tea for the wife of the Prime Minister? I'm sorry, laddie. They can't always be world beaters, you know. Well, thank you, sir. But don't you think you could possibly send me on something interesting? A mission like Stanley and Livingston? <laughs> Anything that has adventure and danger in it. And the <laughs> more difficult, the better, sir. You seem very anxious to lose your life. It's to justify my life, sir. Oh, let me take a guess. Is this about a girl? Uh, why should it be about a girl? Because, as the French say, cherchez la femme. And what would her name be? Gladys. Gladys Hungerton. Well, laddie, I don't know if I have any new worlds for you to discover, but I do have something of a mission for you. If you have the courage. Well, that I have. Have you heard of George Edward Challenger? The famous zoologist? None other. This fellow's caught my eye. 
part genius, part ogre, and perhaps all Munchausen. But, sir, I mean, a simple personality interview? <laughs> simple, hardly. Personality, quite. Two years ago, Challenger went on an expedition to South America, came back with stories, big stories. But when anybody asked him about it, he got touchy. And then they began making fun of him. Now he won't say a word. See what you can make of it. Thank you, sir. It's not exactly what I had in mind, but I'll get right on it. And by the way, he hates reporters. Thanks for the tip. <laughs> into the gutter with you, Vader, interloper. And next time your newspaper sends a reporter here, I'll shoot first. I only wanted to talk to you, Professor. No, you didn't, Mr. Blondell. You want to write about me, and you wish people to laugh. I shall have none of that, and neither shall you. Well, they shall laugh at you, regardless, Challenger. But I intend to report you to the constable. You attacked the press. I did not attack the press, sir. I attacked a reporter. If you do not know the difference, then you have no right being one. Good day, sir. With you out of the house, it is a good day indeed. <laughs> oh, here, here. Let me, let me help you out. <sighs> is that Professor Challenger's house? It is. Are you going in there? I was considering it. Well, reconsider it. The man inside is a villain. Clearly. Oh, my. Your sleeve is torn. Are you injured, oh, sir? Only my pride... Just a moment. Don't, don't I know you? Uh, I don't think so. Yes, I do. You are Malone of the Gazette. I'm Blundell of the Times. Oh, hello. Oh, go on in, then, if you like the sight of your own blood. I've covered factory riots that were more civil. Well, I appreciate your advice. Don't thank me. Be my witness. There's a police station around the corner. I'm having Challenger arrested. I shall return. But it was nice meeting you, Mr Blundell. Ah, George Edward Challenger. No solicitors or reporters. Uh, yes, sir? I'd like to speak to Professor Challenger. Are you expected, sir? I have an appointment. Your letter, please. I beg your pardon? If the professor had granted you an appointment, he would have sent you a letter to that effect. Well, I'm afraid he didn't have time. I, you see... Only today, we happen to be discussing the Weissman versus uh, Darwin theories of evolution, and uh, I uh, had one or two questions about the professor's position. I mean, they're not questions, really. Just requests for clarification. I see. Um, what is your name, young man? Edward Malone. Won't you step in, Mr Malone? Thank you. That is far enough. If you'll be so good as to take a seat in the hall, I'll present your card to Professor Challenger. My card? You do have a card, don't you? Oh, why, why of course I do. Uh, it's on my dresser at the dormitory. <laughs> you see, I'm a graduate student in biology and I, I haven't yet... Did you enjoy a long conversation with the Professor, Mr Malone? It wasn't long, no, but it was meaningful. I mean, that is to say it was inspiring. So much so that here I am, as instructed. I see. Well, just a moment, then. He'll see you now, Mr Malone. Thank you so much. Since you know him so well, I shouldn't have to caution that if he turns violent, get quickly out of the room. Don't argue with him. There are those who have, and the stains are still on the carpet. I suppose you want to discuss South America? Uh, you suppose correctly. You recognize that is his most dangerous subject? Oh, yes. Pretend to believe him, and you'll get through it. If he gets truly dangerous, ring the bell and try to hold him off until I come. Well? Professor Challenger, this is Edward Malone. Oh, thank you for the appointment, sir. That will be all, Austin. Very good, sir. So, you're the one who questions my stand on evolution. I beg your pardon? Because if you do, the problem is yours, not mine. I speak plain English, and my findings are quite well known. Oh, entirely, sir, entirely. Go on. Your understanding gives me great comfort. Despite your age and appearance, you seem to be better informed than those swine in Vienna. Oh, I quite agree. They behaved abominably. You needn't be a sycophantic. All right, let's see how short we can make this. You had some comments about my theory? Well, yes, sir, that is... Uh, oh, uh, come, uh, come, lad, out with it. Well, I, I am, of course, a mere student, but weren't you a little severe with Weissman? Hasn't the evidence since Vienna tended to strengthen his position? What evidence? Yes, 
Well, uh, perhaps not definite evidence. I, I mean the trend uh, toward modern thought. I suppose the... you are aware that the cranial index is a constant factor. Naturally. And that telegeny is still sub judice. Undoubtedly. And that germ plasma is different from parthenogenic egg. Why, surely. And that proves... Indeed. Uh, shall I tell you what that proves? Pray do. It proves that you are a rank imposter, a vile, crawling journalist. Oh, professor, please. Gibberish, man. That's what I've been talking to you. Scientific gibberish. Did you think you could match wits with me? What? Get out of my chair. Get out of my study. Get out of my house. Uh, now, look here, sir. You can be as abusive as you like, but there is a limit. You shall not assault me. Shall I not? Oh, I've grown better than you into the street. Now, will you get your hands off me, sir? And then I'll give you my boot. Oh, I won't stand for this. You won't stand for it, eh? Don't be a fool, Professor. I play rugby. That's right. Now, get out of my house. Down to the front steps and out with you! Austin! Austin! You called, sir! Austin, that's the police. Oh, they're already here, sir. This is the constable. Top of the morning to you, Professor. Good morning, Constable Warren. Well, I'm acting on a complaint filed by Mr. Blondell here of the Times. I couldn't help but notice that uh, history seems to be repeating itself with this other gentleman. Exactly, Constable Warren. I want you to arrest him. In fact, arrest both of them. Well, that might be a bit sticky, sir, you see. I'm here to arrest you. You what? <laughs> what are you laughing at? You! You infernal bully! Uh, <laughs> tell it to the police. Be like your fellow vermin from the Times. I'll do no such thing. What is that? I said I shall settle my own fights. I intruded upon you. You gave me fair warning. Uh, I don't know. What'll it be, sir? Who's bringing charges against who? What'll it be? I said I'm to blame. I bring no charges. Well... Professor? No charges against this one. This other chap, though, this, this Blondell fellow, he's a cretin. Well, I beg uh, your pardon. And an infernal pest. Off with him. Take well, him to the tower. Right you are, Professor. Come along, Mr Blondell. How dare you? I summoned you to bring charges against him. Officer, do your duty. Oh, come along now. Move what? along now. I protest. Don't start with that you sassy you like oh, Come back inside the house, Malone. I may have been hasty. Austin, bring us some brandy. Great character to send that Bobby off, Malone. Great character. But don't expect me to thank you. Yes, indeed. You show the kind of metal I don't often find in other men, let alone reporters. You also have a mean uppercut. How's the eye? Blackened, I suppose. <laughs> so it is. I'd hardly be George Edward Challenger if I didn't take on the press now and again. Well, I'd hate to think of my eye as your badge of honour, sir. Oh, but it is. It is. You may be a journalist, young man, but you have manners and character. That's why I shall grace you with a talk about my South American trip. You will? That is what you came for, is it not? It is, but I... Oh, fine, fine! So, no comments until I'm finished. Your brandy, sir. What brandy? It's time we got going. Oh, first let me get my notebook and pencil out. No, 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 no time for that. You've misunderstood. Put those infernal things away. We're going to the zoological hall. Dr. Emil Illingworth is giving a presentation. His topic, the record of the ages. Is he an authority? He's an idiot. But it will be to your advantage to attend. We have just enough time to get that. Uh, come along. We'll, we'll talk on the way. <laughs> Two years ago, my love, I went to the Amazon to verify the conclusions of Wallace and Bates. The Amazon is still largely unexplored. In the interior, the natives are Cucumber Indians. And when I arrived at their camp, they implored me to give medical attention to one of their number. It turned out he was not an Indian, but a white man. He was in tatters, terribly emaciated, and died before I could do anything to help. Now, the man's knapsack lay beside him. And a sketchbook within it gave his name as one Maple White of Michigan. It is this sketchbook I hand you now. I ask you to examine his drawings and see how he has labelled them. Here's the first one. <sighs> Jimmy Culver on the mail boat. That's pretty mundane. Keep looking. Lunch with Fra Christo Giro at Rosario. Turtles and other eggs. Don't stop. Oh, this looks like crocodiles. Alligators. Nothing unusual here. Now, turn to the next page. Uh, a landscape. And? Oh, looks like a large plateau rising straight up. Describe it. Go ahead, describe it. Well, it appears isolated on all sides by steep cliffs. I mean, I'm no geologist, but it is curious. Curious? Oh, curious indeed. And wonderful. Now, 
Look on the next page. Good Lord. It's monstrous. Yes, the head of a bird, the body of a lizard, and a tail with spikes at the end. This is grotesque. It's enormous. As big as a building. And look what stands beside it. What? What? Is that... Oh, my God, it is. It's a man. Yes. Oh, well, uh, just in time, we're here. Uh, now give it back, quickly. Inside. Inside the hall. Uh, yes, yes. Thank you, Professor Wadley. Thank you for, the, for reading us your inspiring paper on Opus Mellifera, a new order within social insect society. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> and now I would like to introduce our featured speaker, Dr. Emil Illingworth, speaking on the record of the ages. Oh, yes. Dr. Illingworth. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Meldrum, esteemed society members, ladies and gentlemen. The record of the ages is to be found in mammals that led to the emergence of man. We begin low down among the mollusks and feeble sea creatures. Uh, oh, sorry. Very sorry. Stop that. As Wiseman holds, we then climb the evolutionary ladder rung by rung with the reptiles and fishes till at last we come to a kangaroo rat, a creature which brought forth its young alive. This is the direct ancestor of all mammals and presumably, therefore, of everyone in this audience. <laughs> With the possible exception of the man in the red tie in the third role, who seems bent on sharing the contents of his stomach with us this evening. Yes. But what captivates us most are the saurians, the dinosaurians to be exact, that frightful breed of reptile that appears to us in the fossil record, but which was extinct before the appearance of mankind upon this planet. Oh! Was. To be sure, extinct millions of years before the coming of man. Moron! Would Professor Challenger please contain himself? Evolution is not a spent force. It is at work here, even today. But not within these walls! Please, sir, you shall have your turn. Thus, all species descend from their forebears, their progress along the continuum from the past to the present and into the future. Must you be boring as well as ignorant? Stop, stop this disruption, sir. This is a respectable assembly. Thank you, Dr. Meldrum. Yes. But when it comes to challenger, you're wasting your breath. The man has no more manners than an ape hanging from the tree. Would you accept, sir, a reasonable opinion? I should like to hear you utter a reasonable opinion, sir. Very well. A reasonable opinion is... You are an idiot! <laughs> order! Order, please! We will have order! Now, will uh, Professor Illingworth yield to Professor Challenger? Not before I'm finished! Oh, you are finished, Illingworth. You just don't know it. Stand aside. Oh, Professor, really? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen... Oh, I beg pardon. Ladies, gentlemen and children. Well, that is how you are behaving. Just because Dr. Illingworth has never seen prehistoric animals, does that mean that they cannot exist? Yes, yes, yes. Ah! But they do exist, for I have seen them. Liar! Did someone call me a liar? I, a liar! Liar! Shall I come down among you and convince you otherwise? Some decorum, please. Hear me! Hear what I have to say. Order! Every visionary has met with skepticism. Question! After all, ignorance is the last refuge of food. Question, Professor. Ah, there is a woman who seeks a cure for ignorance. Your findings in the Amazon run completely counter to those of Drs. Wallace Bates and other established explorers. How do you account for this discrepancy? Very simple. The Amazon is tens of thousands of square miles. What the others missed, I discovered. And your method, Professor! Was it by careful examination of the facts or fabrication? Oh, well, right. My dear lady, you seem to be confusing the Amazon River with the Thames. <laughs> the Amazon, you see, is somewhat longer, and the country around it far more intriguing than the London drawing rooms you undoubtedly frequent. <laughs> I know the difference, Professor. And I am not your dear lady. Oh. Might I remind you that the claims about the Thames can be tested where yours cannot? As good faith, 
Will you divulge the exact location of your so-called discoveries? Uh, I shall not. That information is proprietary. And unpublishable, which makes it unscientific. You'll raise the same stale argument as my chief critic, Professor Summerley. That is because I am Professor Summerley. Oh, my good God, man. You're a woman. Does that change anything, Professor? Uh, no, no, not at all. I invite you, Professor Challenger, to mm. prove your contention with proper evidence and not just sketchbooks of dubious authenticity. <laughs> well said. And I accept that challenge and dare the Zoological Society to mount and finance such an expedition so that you all can verify my statements to your own sceptical satisfaction. <laughs> What do you say to that, Meldrum? Ah, uh, well, sponsoring an expedition is a delicate matter. Paperwork, grant, proposals, board meetings... Damn the inertia, man! Science marches on! Yes, well, I, I suppose, yes... Oh, I, you're Professor useless. Challenger! Yes, I am. <clears throat> Professor Challenger! Yes! What does my reporter friend want? Ladies and gentlemen, I am Edward Dunn Malone of the Daily Gazette. I shall ask my publisher, Sir George Beaumont, to underwrite your expedition. Oh, very good. Very good. But, very good. but only if I may participate and report on it. And do what? But I am sure Sir George of the Gazette would demand at least that much. Yes, yes, of course. My boy, you shall go. And your paper shall have the exclusive. As if anyone else would want it. Now, you'll eat those words, Illingworth, so help me. Are you trying to ignore me, Challenger? Not at all, Summerley. You are welcome to confirm my discoveries. If they can be, Professor. <laughs> are there any other volunteers? Right here, Professor Challenger. Count on me. And your name, sir? Lord John Roxton. Oh, John Roxton. I've been up the Amazon and I know the region. Thus, I have special qualifications for this investigation. Lord John Roxton's reputation as a sportsman and traveller is world famous. He would make a welcome addition. Thank you. So be it. Very good. Ladies and gentlemen of the London Zoological Society, please recognize Lord John Roxton, Professor Summerley, Edward Don Malone, and myself as the official expedition in search of the lost world. Just a moment, just a moment, please. What, what is it, Dr Erlingworth? Yes. I should like to make a small proposal in the interest of credibility. I should like to hear your not of credibility, sir. Only an objective expedition can confirm your findings. Therefore, I move that you should not accompany the others. Oh, oh, what are you trying to pull now? I further propose that you submit a detailed map of your so-called discovery. You would buy me for my own expedition? It is the Zoological Society's expedition, sir, with the Daily Gazette, and not yours. This is an outrage, an insult. Why, this is a scandal. Oh. And the order... Let's, let's have quiet in the hall, please, can we? May, we must have order now. Dr. Illingworth's position is well taken under the circumstances. Now, it is moved that Professor Challenger withdraw from the expedition. Furthermore, he shall prepare a map and present it in a sealed envelope to a neutral party, Lord John Roxton. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Uh, how dare you? How dare you? All those opposed, nay. Quite a turn about him alone. Listen, since we're to travel together, perhaps you might spare me a few moments to talk. There are one or two things I want to discuss with you. Would you join me? Certainly. Splendid. Meet me at my rooms at the Albany Hotel in half an hour. Until then. the mess haven't quite unpacked from Uganda. So I see. Well, we've gone and done it, haven't we, fellow me lad? Yes, we have. Up to our necks in the terrain, what? What? Look here, Malone. Before we get down to discussing the Amazon, would you help me with a personal matter? You don't mind taking a risk now, do you? What risk? It's Teddy Ballinger. You've heard of him, of course. Ballinger? No. Why, young fellow, where have you lived? Sir Teddy Ballinger? He's a crack shot and a mean drunk. Yes, but where do I come in? Well, he's been on a bender since Tuesday, poor sot. Doctor says he needs food in him, but he's taken to his room just above us with a loaded revolver in his lap, and he swears he'll put six through anyone who dares come in. 
Well, perhaps we could just pass the food under the door. Yes, so I was thinking if we rush him and if he's dozing and if it's dark enough and if there's a dud in the chamber... I, I do believe you're serious. Of course I am. Well, I'm, I'm not... I'm not sure. So I... you won't help, eh? Well, it's not that I won't. It's just that, well, 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 right, come on, then. Talking won't make it any better. Good. I say, Ballinger, are you in there? He's there. Well, uh, perhaps if we set up a diversion. That's the thinking, fellow me lad. I'll tell you what. I'll fire back with my pistol and you rush in on him. Here we go, then. One, two... Three! Oh, God, you shot him! No, 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 look, he's just passed out. Look, he's breathing. He's still holding his gun. Well, then be a good lad and take it from him. Not so fast, stranger. Oh, take it easy, Teddy, we're friends. Well, you may be Roxton, but who's this bloke? I'm Ned Malone. Try to take a man's weapon, will you? That's a crime, sentence of death. Now, don't move. I can't keep you in my sights if you move. Say something, Roxton. Care for a drink, Teddy? I've already had several. <laughs> Been rather a naughty boy. <laughs> oh, still. I haven't moved. Yes, you have. Stop swaying. I can't get a good aim. Uh, you're the <laughs> one who's swaying back and forth, you old reprobate. How about that drink? I tell you what. I'll shoot this fellow first, and then we can go out for a drink. How about we all go out for a drink and not shoot anybody? Oh, don't think so, Ruddy. I'm... Oh, you stupid twit, give me that thing. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well done, you've disarmed him. Well, what's so funny? <laughs> all right, fellow me lad, you'll do. Uh, I'll do what? You'll do up the Amazon. Thanks, what? Teddy. My pleasure, old chap. What's going on here? Are you having at me? <laughs> Roxton here asked me to help see if you had your stuff, you know. Uh, Gave me a pistol and a handful of blanks. Left the rest of me. How was I? Oh, listen, you could headline on the strand, Teddy. Come on, Malone. Go on. We have some packing to do. Would someone please explain? Well, you see, this South America business is mighty serious. If we're going to be travelling partners, I want someone I can depend on. Thanks a lot, Ballinger. I owe you one. Right, lad. Lunch at the club when you get back to Absolutely. Here. Come on, Malone. Back to my apartment. It's important we understand each other, Malone. It'll be just the two of us on this thing. Can you imagine Summerlee in a close call? Oh, quite possibly. Well, I can't. By the way, you wouldn't be the Malone who used to play rugby for Ireland. I would. Well, I thought I remembered your face. Well, I saw you play against Richmond. As fine a player as they had the whole season. Can you shoot? Passably. Well, no matter. You'll have time to practice. What's your weapon? Words. Oh, yes. Well, may I suggest Bland's 577 Axit Express? Or perhaps a Gordon 470 with telescopic sight and double ejector? Well... On the other hand, perhaps my basic Winchester will do you. Look, is that really necessary? This is a scientific quest, not a big game hunt. Unless the professor's a madman or a liar, we're going to see some strange things before we get back. By the way, what do you know of Challenger? Oh, I never met him till today. Nor did I. But do you know what? I believe every single word he says. South America is a land I love. Grandest, most wonderful place on the planet. The rainforest is a whole other world. The more you know of that country land, the more you understand that anything, anything is possible. So be off with you. Start packing. Pack everything you think you'll need, then unpack it. And do it again to make sure. Because once we sail, there's no turning back. <laughs> A word, please, before you embark. Yes, how can I ever thank you for sending me to Professor Challenger? I thought that would be obvious, laddie. By sending back accounts that will keep both of us from being fired. <laughs> Is Sir George complaining already? No, and I intend to keep him from starting. But the only way to do that is for you to get me stories. I've thought of that, sir. I'll set up regular telegraphic communications. Once we head into the interior, I'll send back dispatches with native bearers, which will then be relayed back to you. Now remember, Malone, I want exotic places, wild beasts, high adventure. But most of all, bring me the lost world. Let me have your attention, everybody. 
Samerley, Roxton, Malone. Oh, yes, yes, right here. Yes, Gather yes, round. Here we go. I have only a few words to say. The first is that I wish I were going with you. Oh, you Secondly, say. here is the sealed envelope which Lord Roxton shall hold for safekeeping. The contents are the instructions mandated by the Zoological Society for the successful completion of this expedition. Well, that's to stop me from opening it now. Your word of honour, Lord John, which you shall give me before I hand you the envelope. You have it, sir. Good. I do not want the contents revealed until you arrive at Manaus. Don't you trust us? I trust no one, Summerley. I have too many jealous colleagues who covet my knowledge in the face of their own ignorance. Well, personally, <laughs> I shall miss your colourful company, Professor. Mr Malone, you are free to write about anything you see except your exact location. And Professor Summerley, if you are still capable of improvement, which I doubt, you shall return to London all the wiser for what you are about to experience. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, excuse me, young lady. Pardon me, sir. Ned? Oh, Ned, there you are. Gladys, I've been waiting for you all morning. I'm afraid I was detained, Ned, but here you are. And here you are. Uh, aren't you going to introduce me to this lovely young lady, my love? Oh, yes, of course. Miss Gladys Hungerton, may I present... Mr. McArdle, my editor on the Daily Gazette. How do you do, Mr. McArdle? <laughs> Much better for having met the woman that Ned is always talking about. He is? <laughs> oh, but only in the most flattering way. Oh. And now it's my turn to leave. I look forward to hearing from you, Malone, with adventure and frequency. Good day, Miss Hungerton. Mr. McArdle? What's that, Come along now, last call. All ashore, let's go in that shore. Last call. Quickly, quickly, Gladys, we don't have much time. After all these months of seeing each other, I think it's time that Why we should... Why do I get the feeling that you are going to propose? Ah, uh, well... Oh, I wish you wouldn't. Things are much nicer as they are. Oh, really? Did you think you could catch me unawares? Well, since when has anything ever caught you unawares? <laughs> no, what, what I'm trying to say Our is that... friendship is so pleasant. What a pity to spoil it with an engagement, especially when you're going away for who knows how long. Yes, but I, I, I should think that you would count the days till our return, you know, keep the candle burning or oh, some other sign of... Oh, now Everything. It was all so beautiful until you started to talk proposal. Why can't you control yourself? Well, I've been controlling myself damn well these past six months for a man who's in love. Oh, please don't be. You see, I'm not. Gladys, I mean, you, you truly are extraordinary. Thank you, Ned. You see, the man I love must be bold, an adventurer. Then I wouldn't love just the man, but the glories he represented. I want a soldier, an explorer. I want to inspire noble deeds, not just romantic words. So it's an explorer you want, is Look it? Look at that young Frenchman who went up in a balloon. It was a blowing gale of a wind, but because he said he'd go, he went. The wind blew him 1,500 miles into the middle of Russia. That's the kind of man I want. Did he ever come? Come back, Gladys? Oh, dear Ned, of course he didn't, but that's not the point. Well, Gladys, I intend to write great stories on this expedition and I intend to return. Oh, oh, yes. Well, then I might consider you a worthy suitor. Oh, why, thank you, Gladys. I'm sure that that commitment will give me all the strength I, I need. I said might. When you have won your place in the world, we shall talk it over again. But for now, goodbye, Ned. Goodbye, Gladys. Dateline, the Amazon. Dear Mr. McCardle, our Atlantic crossing was uneventful, but Roxton playfully assures me that this will soon change. First, however, I wanted I want to, to write, write to you of our up. progress. We arrived and put ashore at Campo Grande at the mouth of the Amazon. After a night's rest, we boarded the Esmeralda, which took us upriver to Manaus. This is our embarkation point, a village halfway up the Amazon. At least they say it's halfway, for no one truly knows how long the Amazon is. Oh, this is going to sell a lot of papers. The golden sun glistens on the dark, shimmering waters. I can see native women washing their laundry and bathing themselves, the rays of sun sparkling on their bare breasts. Good God, the lad's gone balmy. I think we can skip the bare-breasted women. Yeah, oh, here we go, here we are. Manaus will be the last outpost of civilization. 
I'm arranging telegraphic communication. The experienced Roxton has engaged a local guide named Gomez. Fortunately, Gomez speaks excellent English. Finally, tomorrow morning, on the veranda of the Fazenda Santa Ignacia, we shall open the sealed envelope on which the success of our expedition rests. Instructions to Lord John Roxton and party to be opened at Manaus July 15th at 12 o'clock noon and not a moment earlier. Well, we have three more minutes. What can possibly matter whether we open it now or in three minutes? It's all part and parcel of the quackery and nonsense for which I regret to say Professor Challenger is notorious. Oh, come, Summerlee. We must play the game according to rules. Unless there's something pretty definite in this envelope, we've been played for fools and I'm on the next boat home. Oh, surely it's time, Lord John. Time it is. Now, let's have a look at this secret missive. Why? It's blank. <laughs> what? <laughs> look in the envelope again. What more proof do you want? The man's a complete fake. Invisible ink. It must have been invisible ink. No, I don't think so. Hold it up to the sun. No. No, it's blank. Well, now what are we supposed to do? I'll tell you what I'm doing. I'm telegraphing the Zoological Society this moment. Don't and then... Baba. Good God. Well, May I come in? Challenger. Well, I'll be. Yes. Sorry to disappoint you, Samale. Oh, what's this? Bananas? My favourite. I see you're healthy in body, if not in mind. Professor, we agreed that you were not to come. Why are you here? To see how well you managed in my absence. But we couldn't have gone any further without instructions. <laughs> Just my point. Even the most explicit instructions would not have been enough. And that is why I am here to carry on. But this here, is against here. your own promise. A promise coerced me by academic imbeciles. Professor, we need a destination. Is there a map where to follow? There is indeed, Roxton, and it's safely stored in my head. Even the most elaborate charts would pale in comparison with my own intelligence. Mm. Not to mention your duplicity. Professor Summerley, you have no idea what a pleasure it will be to argue with you face to face. The pleasure is mine. Good. Now to work. We gather at the riverbank at dawn tomorrow morning. We have the dry season on our side, but not the daylight. Well, until tomorrow. Dateline, the Amazon. This is my last transmission from Manaus. We have loaded all the provisions in our canoes and we leave within the hour. The adventure begins. Well, Professor Summerley, I wouldn't have taken an academic such as yourself for an athlete. Are you surprised that I can paddle a canoe? Well, you've been doing it for some time and you don't seem winded. There are many things a woman can do without getting winded, Lord John. Paddling a canoe is one of the minor ones. Well, I, I didn't mean to be forward. It's just that the expedition will seem longer if we don't make some sort of conversation. With Professor Malone and Gomez in the other canoe, and we're the only two in this one who can speak English, I, I thought we might get better acquainted. I do apologize, Lord John. You're quite right. I should not forget my manners even here in the mm. jungle. Huh. Look at Malone, trying to make conversation with Challenger. I wonder what they're saying. Yes. Professor, uh, may I inquire? Uh, you and Professor Summerley hate each other. Why did you encourage her to come along on this trip? The answer to the first is obvious. She's a wrong-headed scientist who has questioned my theories in the press. Her theories run counter to mine and are therefore counter to the truth. Well, does it change anything that she's a woman? Certainly not. As if science cares about gender. Yes, but why did you... Excuse me, Professor Challenger. What is it, Senor Gomez? There are rapids a mile down the river. I know, Gomez. These are the very rapids where I lost my specimens last time. We must portage around them. Yes, and spend two days hacking our way through the vegetation and probably die of snake bite. But, Professor... I know, I know. It has to be done. What's that sound? Is that drums? Yes, yes. Gomez, what is it? We are not alone. I say, do you hear the drums? What do you make of them? I've heard them before, many times. War drums. War drums? Yes, sir. War drums. Wild Indians. They watch us. How can they watch us? I can't see them. Ah, uh, but they can see you. They have their own voice. 
They talk, the drum talk to each other. We will kill you if we can. We will kill you if we can. It is not safe on land, Senor Malo. Not until we have passed the rapids. What was that? They are shooting at us. They're under attack. <gasps> Row. Row oh. faster. Don't look back. Oh, that was a close oh. one. Switch sides. Weave. Make a harder target. Stay in the middle. Oh. Put your backs into it. Let me have a go at it. Good work, Rockstar. Oh, I can't even see the fuckers. What am I shooting at? We're pulling away. We're oh. pulling away. Oh, what's that I hear? It's All right, everyone. Middle. There's no stopping now. Use your oars. Oh. Push away from the rocks. Oh. Watch out for the trees. Oh. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Oh. Hold on! Find the boulders! Paddle with the colonel and watch out for that tree! It's a whirlpool! Go from the other side! I am, I am! Stop it out! Go with the colonel! I am! Uh -huh. Let it take you! Oh, look, it's working, it's working! Look out ahead! Below the surface! We hit something! Yes, oh, it's just oh. a glancing blow! Head for there! Don't it! They right. pull their port side! Yes, I'll push it off! There, there, there you go, there you go! Go Come with on. the colonel! Oh, we're down the other side! Look out for the rocks! Oh, we're down for the rocks! This is wonderful! This is sensational! Finally, that brave lad's earning his salary. That's what I've been telling you, Sir George. What does he say, then? I'll read it to you. Surprisingly, we survived the rapids, and we've camped for the night about 500 yards downstream. Gomez, our guide, assures us that the natives will not follow us because of something he calls Kurupuri. Copy boy! Copy boy! Here I am, sir. Here. Take this to typeset and bring me the proofs the moment they're ready. Right away, sir. Is this the latest from Ned Malone? Here now. Are you interested, oh, my boy? Cheapest, said George. Me and my mates, we think it's the best make-believe we ever read. Oh, all right, all right, boy. Off with you. <laughs> sir, I'm publishing fiction now. No, no, no. Not fiction, Sir George. Just truth. So far ahead of our time that only a true visionary uh, such as yourself can comprehend it. Make sure it sells newspapers. Ah, quick, uh, bring the canoes out of the water. Hide uh, them under these bushes. Right, uh, exhilarating. Uh, Want to shoot the uh, rapids. Everything uh, keeps the blood flowing. Uh, Tie the line over here. The current is weak. Uh, Dumb the glade. It won't drift off. Uh, come on. From now on, we make our way by foot. Yes, it's just as I remembered it. It won't be long before we reach our destination. And that would be? Time to reveal. When? When the time comes. We have left the river at the point where Professor Challenger says that the real journey begins. This glade, undistinguished except to his keen memory, is where he says he encountered the phenomenon that inspired his discovery. Let's keep moving. No time to lose. I must say, I like your attitude, Challenger. I never figured you for an adventurer. Ah, but that's where you're wrong, Roxton. Science is the greatest adventure of them all. There are those damn drums again. Oh, don't take it personally, Malone. It's territorial. What? The drums mark their territory. Think of it as dogs barking from the safety of a backyard. A dog with poison-tipped arrows, Senor Roxanne. Yes, uh, certainly the Marana and even the Amawaka use poison to fell their prey. But not if they intend to consume it. You mean they're cannibals? Of course they are. Oh, my God. Oh. You misunderstand cannibalism, Senor Malone. Tribes do not hunt each other for food. There is plenty of game in the jungle to feed them. They hunt men to please. Kurapuri. Kurapuri? The spirit of the jungle. It's the name of a kind of devil. Is it a religion or superstition? What? It's a bit of both. There's usually some truth to such pagan beliefs. Second time today, I agree with you, Summerlee. Oh. The human animal usually worships a power it cannot understand. Huh? No one has seen the Kurapuri. Has ever lived to tell about it. If that's the case, how do you know it exists? How do you know it doesn't? <sighs> ah, here's the little creek I've been looking for. It leads to the great Amazon, but its waters are ten degrees hotter than the river. I'll show you. 
Uh, bring me the aneroid thermometer, Summerlee. The mercury is more accurate. Don't tell me my business. I clearly specified aneroid. May I ask, sir, in what capacity you take it upon yourself to issue these orders? As leader of this expedition. I am compelled to inform you, sir, that I do not recognize you in that capacity. Perhaps then you would care to define my exact position? I will, sir. You are a man whose veracity is on trial. You walk, sir, with your judges. Dear me, in that case, you will, of course, go on your way collecting evidence. I shall follow you at my leisure. I beg your pardon? If I am not the leader, you cannot expect me to lead. Oh. Well, go on. What are you waiting for? Oh, now, please. please. Be quiet, both of you. If this bickering continues, this expedition will not. We're all adults. Isn't there some way of reconciling? No. no. Well, then, I suppose Dr. Illingworth was right. Illingworth, what about him? Nothing. Hmm. I was merely postulating that the celebrated Dr. Illingworth, whose presentation at the Zoological Society led to this Emil journey... Emil Illingworth wouldn't know a fossil if he stumbled on one, which, as a matter of fact, is exactly how he discovered Lycanthus deciduous. Oh, well, I thought his credentials were well established. He's an idiot. He's a blithering idiot. Really? You were at the lecture, man. It was a travesty. Hipped upon a charade. I agree. Illingworth wouldn't know a wild pig from a long pig. As a matter of fact, he is one. Which one? Either. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right, Summerley. Do as you please. You use your newfangled mercury thermometer and I'll stick to my aneroid. <sighs> Illingworth, indeed. You know, stay out of these things from now on, Roxton, and leave science to the scientists. Yeah. Good work, Roxton. Yes, thank heaven for small favors. As long as we can use Illingworth as a tiebreaker, we may all survive this adventure. We're now going on ten days afoot. The character of the land has changed repeatedly. We emerge from the trees to a wilderness of elephant grass so thick that we penetrated only by cutting away with machetes. The next day, we came into an open plain dotted with clumps of tree ferns. Surprisingly, little animal life present with the exception of one or two small snakes. This is putting me to sleep. What does he think we're running, a travel magazine? Please! One or two small snakes. Cubby boy! Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Take this down to the composing room. Have him use it on Malone's story. Small snakes. Here! That'll wake them up in the provinces. Extra, extra, huge pythons attack expedition. Jungle overrun with vermin. Intrepid reporter almost devoured. Extra, extra, read all about it. Professor, can you explain why the jungle doesn't grow in what is obviously a rainforest? Aren't you burning to hazard a guess, my dear Summerley? I shan't guess. I shall postulate. And the word burning is correct. The soil is abnormally warm, too warm to support jungle vegetation. Warm? Wouldn't that suggest current volcanic activity? It most assuredly would. In fact, I suspect this whole region is a slumbering field. <sighs> Did you see that, Summerley? What? Did you see it in the distance? I saw something. Where? Where? Near those rocks. A huge bird flapped up, swooped low enough to skim something off the ground, then disappeared into the tree ferns. What the devil was it? To the best of my belief, it was a pterodactyl. A pterodactyl? <laughs> Fiddlesticks. It was a stork, if I ever saw one. Good God, woman, what would a stork be doing here? What would a pterodactyl be doing here? Anyway, it's gone. Lord John, you were looking through your binoculars. Did you see it? Uh, not well, but I'll risk my reputation oh. that it wasn't any bird I've ever seen. Of course, Professor Summerley will understand that when I speak of pterodactyl, I mean a stork. Oh. Except that this stork has no feathers. It has a leathery skin, membranous wings, and teeth in its jaws. Oh, really? Come on, stop bickering. Let's get moving. We don't want to let it get away. Come on. Save your excitement, Roxton. There's plenty more where that came from. In fact, exactly where that came from. Within a hundred yards, we had traveled to the top of a small hillock, and there, before us in the distance, stretched the ominous red plateau that I had first seen in Maple White's sketchbook. Do you see it? Take a good look at it. Have you ever encountered anything so amazing? My God. 
Never in all my travels. It's completely flat on top, jutting 600 feet straight up out of the ground. Wonder is imposing, a true phenomenon of nature. That is my lost world! Oh. How did it? I mean, how could it? It's probably the result of some monumental explosion so immense that it pushed an entire ecosystem straight up. Look at those sheer walls. Nothing can get up. And more importantly, nothing can get down. Professor Challenger's fabled Amazon Plateau greets us through dwindling daylight, daring us to approach. It rises defiantly like the devil's dinner table. Its sheer walls defy us to ascend. Ha! Ah, that's more like it. Daring. Defiant. Beside the formation stands one lone pinnacle like a church steeple detached from the plateau. A silent sentry watching over unimaginable secrets. Our task now is to find the way up. Extra, extra, Challenger Expedition finds Lost World, exploration to follow, extra, extra. All right, we should make our camp here. Oh, Gomez, have it, the porters it, make a circle it, and collect firewood. See, si, senor, I will start the tent and build the fire. Yeah, there's a good fellow. Malone, if you crane your neck anymore, you'll fall over backwards. Yes, but that rock face is immense. How do we ascend? I mean, the facade, it shoots straight up. It leans outward. It's impossible to scale. Is it like this all the way around? I don't know. Last time I circled to the east a quarter of the way around and found nothing. Then the rains and lack of provisions forced me to quit. But there must be a way up. How did Maple White do it? Ah, that, Summerlee, is the mystery we shall solve. Professor, Professor, look at this. Are you sure that you were the first man to this location? Why are you asking? Because if I didn't know better... I'd say we'd come upon somebody's camp. Look at this rubbish. Yes. There's meat tins, a brandy bottle, old clothing. Yes, yes, yes. It has all the appearance of an abandoned base camp. What's this? An old newspaper? A newspaper? Yes, can't read the date on it, but I can make out some of the letters. C-H-I-C. It's the Chicago American. Yes, it is. It must be Maple White's. This must have been his camp. I oh. say, look here. Look at this. Look at this tree. Some sort of a sign chiseled in the bark. You are right. It is a sign. It's pointing over there to the west, to that bamboo thicket. <gasps> Roxton, proceed with caution. Those plants must be 20 feet tall. Anything could be hiding in them. Well, Samale, how does this match my story so far? Well, we've found your plateau, I'll grant you that. But as far as prehistoric beasts dwelling on top of it, well, I'll let my eyes see for themselves. <gasps> Good God! Don't anyone move. It's a human skull. Oh, God, you're right. It's hideous. The bamboo is growing straight through the side of his head. Oh. The rest of the skeleton is over here. Flesh has been stripped from the ball. Oh. oh, devil. Dreadful way to die. Every inch of his body must have been perforated by the bamboo. And his own weight carried him slowly down to the ground. Oh. What? All the flesh! Eaten by insects, maggots, birds. The jungle reclaims its own. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, it would seem that we are staring at the earthly remains of James Culver. How do you know that? This cigarette case on the ground, tarnished but intact, bears his name. There can't be much doubt about how he met his death. He fell. Or was pushed. What are you saying, Roxton? Basic police work. If he simply fell, he would have landed close to the foot of the cliff. But to be impaled this far out, he must have been thrown with great force over the edge. Kura Puri. Oh, nonsense. The only spirit in this jungle is the spirit of adventure. Look! Look over there! At the base of the cliff, there's a small cave. Do you think it might lead all the way up to the top? It may have once, but now it's completely blocked. If this is how Maple White and James Culver got up two years ago, it's sealed to us. Probably the result of earthquakes. There must be another way up. I didn't come this far to be thwarted. Let's make camp. Tomorrow, our luck will change. Dateline. Maple White Land. This is the name that we have christened the Lost World. In honor of the man who led us here, even in death. We're presently encamped at the base of the plateau. We shall try to find a route up. Lord Roxton has shot a pig. Bring it here, Lord Rockster. I'll cut it up. No, I shot it. I'll gut it. If you don't mind, I'll find something else to watch. 
Lady Doctor does not care for guts, eh? In a word, no, Gomez. Let me know if there's anything else I can do for you. It will not take long. Then we eat. Professor Summerley? Ah, uh, yes, Mr. Malone. How are you feeling after your encounter with Mr. Culver? Uh, I'll manage. It just took me by surprise, Mr. Malone. Ned, please. Why do you insist on my calling you Ned? So that I might call you Elizabeth. <sighs> All right. Ned. Thank you, Elizabeth. As I was saying... <gasps> My God, what on earth is that? What? It's cool, oh, buddy! Oh, it's, it's cool, cool. it's cool. It's oh, get the gun, Moxton! Don't shoot! Stop it! Don't shoot! Get away! Shine a torch on it! Let's see it! Oh, it's incredible! Those red eyes. <sighs> Our friends decided to pay us a visit. <sighs> <sighs> It's gone. It got away. Yes, what a ghastly beast. Did you see what it was, Summerlee? I... I... I've never seen anything like it. Nor has any living man or woman. What is it? It would appear that I... Oh, I owe you an apology, sir. Your apology is accepted on one condition and one condition only. And it is. And we forget our past differences and get on with more important business. Agreed. Would somebody tell me what it is? Would you care to do the honors, Summerley? It's a pterodactyl. Extra, extra, challenger expedition discovers patera... a patera... um... Well, it's a big flying dinosaur. Extra, extra... We spent the next three days circling the plateau, looking for a way up, enduring fetid marshes, the breeding ground of the deadly Herakaka snake. Again and again, these creatures slithered toward us. Only Roxton's quick pistol kept us from certain tragedy. See here, Challenger, this is pointless. I didn't come here to hunt snakes. We spent the better part of a week looking for an ascent and have found nothing. Senor Challenger, there may be a way up, and uh, also across. The pinnacle again, Gomez? See, si. take Lord John's binoculars. Here you are. All right, yes, I'm looking. At the very top of the pinnacle, closer to the edge of the plateau, there is a tree. Do you see it? Yes. We climb the pinnacle, cut the tree, and... And walk across! Yeah. See. Si. Why, of course! You're a good man, good Gomez. Gomez. Thank you. Sharp eyes and yes. a crafty mind. Yes. Come, we have our work cut out for us. Challenger led the assault on the pinnacle. Summerlee proved to be extraordinarily fit. Roxton was certainly experienced, and Gomez never complained. Finally, we reached the top, 600 feet above the jungle floor. This way, my young friend. Never look back, or down for that matter, but always ahead. Everybody stand back! Stand back! Timber! It's down. It's a perfect bridge. Well done, Gomez. Thank you, senor. Would you like to be the first one to cross it? Me? Uh, uh, no. Then I claim the honor. A fitting subject, no doubt, for some future historical painting. Ah, sorry, Challenger, but I can't allow it. What? When it's a matter of science, I follow your lead, but now you must follow mine. Of course. We all have our professions, and mine is soldiering. Who's to say there's not a tribe of savages on the other side waiting to slaughter us? Oh, John, you've hauled up rifles and provisions. Surely you can sit here and pick off any threat that might wait to shake my hand when I step off that bridge. As a matter of safety, sir. As a matter of safety, we could have fallen off this cliff onto the bamboo poles twenty times. At long last, sir, will you stand aside and allow me to continue my expedition? I shall not. Oh, oh very well. Since you insist... Roxton crossed with ease and assurance. Then Challenger, and then Summerlee was the third to cross, and then I. We all crossed, except Gomez. And we stood congratulating ourselves, when suddenly... Professor, the bridge is falling! What? What happened? <laughs> Gomez! What happened? <laughs> Lord Roxton! What is it, man? Lord 
John Rockstar! Well, here I am. What have you done? Yes, there you are, you English dog. And there you will remain. What's all this about? I have waited and waited. And now has come my chance. Your precious bridge is gone. You found it hard to get up. You will find it harder to get down. <laughs> Why have you done this? You cursed fools. You are trapped, every one of you, especially Lord Rockstar. See here, Lord John. What do you know of this? I haven't the foggiest idea. You lie, Rockstar. As you all start to death, think of Lopez. Lopez? Who's Lopez? Do you hold man's life so cheap that you forgot you took it? Lopez, you shot him five years ago on the Putumayo River. I am his brother. And now the Lord has given me the way of avenging him. So you'll exact your vengeance on innocent others? Their lives are a small price to pay for my brothers. You are even less of a man than your brother, and your brother was nothing. At least I live to see you die. Damn you, Gomez. We shall find a way down and we shall spend the rest of our lives hunting you. Your brother was a thief and caused the death of two other guides. It makes no difference now. Your death is a brother's death. Avenge! Adios! He's climbing down. He's taking the rope with him. There are no trees anywhere near here. We're trapped. Hand me my rifle. What are you going to do? Roxton, you can't. <laughs> I have. You killed him! In case you didn't realize it, he has considerably lessened our chances of getting out alive. And so you appointed yourself his judge, jury, and executioner? In this godforsaken country, yes. Move away from the edge. It's dangerous. We will sort this out later. We have a lost world to explore. In this uncharted world, who was to say that Roxton's deed was unwarranted? Clearly, survival was more important than justice. At least it seemed so now. Nevertheless, it put a pall over us as we took our first steps into this strange domain. We had headed inland about a quarter of a mile when... Ned, don't move. Whatever you do, don't move. What is it? I'm studying something. On the back of my neck? What is it? An enormous blood tick, at least an inch long. Don't study it! Get it off! Oh, you crushed it! Damn right! I didn't even get a chance to classify it! Classify it dead! Come now, Malone. The inconvenience of being bitten cannot weigh against the glorious privilege of having your name inscribed on the rolls of zoology. Yeah, a blood tick named Ned. Ixadis Maloney. In its way, that blood tick is as beautiful a work of nature as the peacock. Glad you feel that way, Challenger, for another one just crawled up your pant leg. What? Oh, <laughs> get it off! Get it off! Where did it put it again? Don't move! <laughs> Challenger! Challenger, don't move! Be still! Why? What is it? You've fallen on what looks like a... a... a footprint. So I have. Oh, and I've damaged oh. it. No matter. Here's another one over oh, here. Yes. Five yards apart? What kind of steps must this beast take? Some kind of elephant? Twice as large as any elephant I've ever seen. These tracks measure half a yard across. And they're fresh. Water's just filling the impression. Whatever made them hasn't gone far. My friends, unless my scholarship suddenly fails me, we are looking at the recently made tracks of a brontosaurus. <laughs> Very recent. And very close, too. What do we do now, Professor? I'm open to suggestions. I suggest we run. Run. Run, run, run! Extra! Extra! Scientists attacked by monsters! Lives in danger! Extra! So read all about it. Explorers and daring escape. The big story. Read all about it. Explore. A 
It's the end of Act One. We'll see you in a few minutes. That's right, boy. Sell them like your life depends on it. Well, now we're in the thick of it. Thank God Ned's got the bit between his teeth. No sooner had we arrived on the isolated plateau than a gigantic beast lumbered straight toward us and we scrambled to the cover of the woods. From there we watched, crouching in the protection of the brush, and witnessed an extraordinary sight. A brontosaurus. Living brontosaurus. This is the research of ten lifetimes. Look at it. Forty feet high and a hundred feet long. It's amazing. It's eating from the treetops. Why not? It's a herbivore. From what we know of these gentle dinosaurs, they subsist on plants and insects. Do you realize that every moment we're here provides us with insight no other human being has ever had? Let's keep moving inland. Our friendly brontosaurus may only eat plants. But there must be other dinosaurs that eat brontosauruses. Oh, it's too late, Roxon. Everyone, lay down! Oh, God, it's a megalodon! Stalking! Will they fight? Surely as mongoose and cobra. Get off just one good shot. Don't waste the ammunition, Roxton. Its skin is as thick as a rhinoceros. Besides, we're here to observe. Oh, remarkable. It's balancing on its two powerful haunches. Look! Its forearms aren't as useless as we thought. It's actually holding the tree limb in front of it. Camouflage. <gasps> oh. It's charging the brontosaurus. It's swinging around, look out. Oh. Oh, that was too close. Let's move on. No, wait. The Megalodon has the brontosaurus by the throat. Jerking his tiny head around, trying to snap it off. It's turning. It's turning. It's rolling out. As we retreated into the darkness of the nearby forest, we continued to hear the gigantic struggle in the distance. After a few miles, we stumbled upon a large, festering bog of blue-gray mud. Enormous ferns encircled the swamp, creating a landscape of eons gone by. Putrid gas bubbled up through the thick, stagnant ooze. We found ourselves entranced by this primordial sight. After a time, Roxton drew our attention to the far side of the quagmire. An old lava formation jutted some hundred feet into the sky. Ominous cooing sounds could be heard emanating from its pitted facade. And what we saw amazed us. Look, look over there. Be careful. One false sound, and we risk rousing them. Pterodactyl! Oh. The entire rookery. Carrying everywhere. As long as the wind doesn't shift, they won't smell us. No, oh, but we could smell them. Oh, what have uh, you do? No quick movements. There must be at least a hundred. Oh, the smell. Blood and bones everywhere. And look, look. Yes. Yes, the young squabbling over morsels of flesh. This is incredible, absolutely incredible. I'm going closer. No, no, be careful. You'll scare them. Just be on this stump. Watch out. Oh, gee. Oh, there. A challenger. Oh, how touchy, aren't they? Remarkable. Flocking like birds. Yes, with razor sharp talons. Come on, let's keep moving. The wood thins out just beyond the rise. We should make camp as soon as possible. Right you are, Roxton. I think we've had enough excitement for one day. What do you make of these three, Samily? Strange growth pattern, don't you think? Very unusual. Almost another level of life on top of them. See how thick the upper branches are. Yeah, what, what if I climb this one over here, this tall one? If I get to the upper branches, I ought to be able to reconnoiter. Capital idea. It's time we knew where we were. 
Give him a load of hand rocks. Right, right. All right, up you go. Steady, Ali. Oh. <laughs> Malone, tell us what's out there. The terrain ahead of us. We have a whole world to explore. Uh, Professor Challenger, uh, may I remind you that the original purpose of coming here was to find the lost world, not explore it. We are ill-equipped for this type of campaign. I think we should get back to England as soon as possible and form a proper expedition. She's got a point there, Challenger. Yes. Professor! I can see almost the entire plateau from here. It's fantastic! It's primordial, landscape, lush and varied. Yes! First, there's a central lake about a mile from here. Probably rainfall. How else could a plateau get water? Mm. Uh, what do you see straight ahead? Oh, uh, not much past the lake. There's mist rising up off the water. Wait, wait. Perhaps those are cliffs far off. Oh, damn. Here come the pterodactyls again. Let's get you down from yes, there. No I'm need down. to take unnecessary risks. Right, right. Lots to do before nightfall. All right. How could you think of going back, Summerlee? It's not a matter of simply going back, Professor. I want to stay here as much as you do, but I have experience that tells me... Oh, what that could we... you have possibly experienced, young lady, in your brief career that would compel us to leave an expedition of this magnitude? Oh. Ah! Oh. Oh. What is it? Make way. Make way. Not so fast. You'll slip. No. Oh. Oh. What was it? What did you see? Oh, there was a face. Where? It was two feet from mine. Calm yourself, lad. Tell us what happened. I was coming down, hand over hand, while a, a face swung in front of me. What did it look like? Was it human? I... I don't know. It was mostly human. Long, whitish, flat nose. The lower jaw was projecting it, and, and a few whiskers, I think. I oh, it's an orangutan. No, I tell you, it was m more human than that. It opened its mouth and snarled. So did I, in a manner of speaking. I don't know which one of us was more frightened. Did it have a tail? Not that I saw. Was the foot prehensile? Did it grab branches with its foot? I, I think so. I mean, how else could it get away so fast? Some sort of monkey, I suspect. Are you all right, Ned? Yes, yes. I don't see it in the branches anywhere. Uh, no, nor do I. Whatever it is, it's gone now. If it does come back, I'll take care of it. Meanwhile, we should set up camp. Capital! I'm famished! Dateline. The Lost World. We made camp at the base of the tree. The night was cold, and so the fire was welcome. Supplies were beginning to run low. There's been a debate among us whether to shoot game. But since we've yet to see anything smaller than a dinosaur, that would seem somewhat problematic. <laughs> Sometime after midnight, still unable to close my eyes, I decided to do some cautious exploration. The moon was quite bright, so getting about was not difficult. I left the camp, undetected, and I walked about for a while, until I came upon a herd of medium-sized dinosaurs sleeping. The moonlight illuminated their massive, slumbering forms, and I was reminded of a herd of gentle cows. <laughs> Being careful not to wake them, I continued along the perimeter of the clearing. In a few minutes, I came to a ridge, and I peered at the central lake that I had seen from the treetop. My attention was soon drawn to two armadillo-like creatures that had come to the water's edge. After watching them scurry about the shore, looking for food, my attention was drawn to a disturbance in the middle of the lake. Something was moving through the water with swift and deliberate speed. Moments before reaching the beach, it raised itself from the water. The action was so swift that the only thing I remember was the massive head and the terrifying teeth. In a single lunge, it devoured the two creatures. After that, I decided I had explored enough and I turned away from the lake and I retraced my steps. When I was but a mile away from the camp, I thought I heard footsteps behind me. I turned to look, and sure enough, a great dark shape 
expanded onto my path, not 20 feet from where I stood. Its hot, rank breath assaulted my nostrils as I peered into the black, lifeless, unforgiving eyes. Suddenly, a wide, frog-like mouth opened and it flicked a ghastly red tongue into the air, and I ran. I ran madly into the woods. My face and body were thrashed by branches. I dashed faster and faster. My chest ached. My lungs wanted to burst. Suddenly, the ground fell out from under me. And I passed out. When I awakened, the night was silent. Looking about, I found myself in some kind of hole. The first thing I perceived was the stench of rotting flesh. It seemed that I was lying on the carcass of a dead animal. But how? As I climbed out, I struggled to make sense of what had happened. From the edge, I looked round and saw that I had tumbled into a pit and only survived by landing upon an animal that had fallen in first and had been impaled upon sharpened spikes. It then dawned on me. This pit had been deliberately dug. Its spikes had been sharpened, and it was a trap. We were not the only humans in the lost world. It was nearly sunrise now, and the rays of light pierced the canopy of the forest as I raced back with my new found realization. It was not until I was standing in the middle of our encampment that I discovered, to my horror, that my colleagues were gone. Hello? Hello? Elizabeth? Professor Challenger! Roxton! Where is everybody? Hello? Hello? Oh, God! What am I going to do? The, the, the camp has been ransacked! Hello? Hello? Oh, shh! Not so loud, for God's sake, be still. Good God! Look at you, Roxton. Where are the others? Quick! Every moment counts. Uh, where are they? Get the rifles, the cartridges, fill your pockets. What? Food, what? what? Too. Get a move on or we're done. Look, you're not making sense. Roxton, tell me what happened. The ape men. What you saw in the trees. My God, what brutes. Dozens of them. Dozens? Shh! Don't raise your voice. They have sharp hearing and sharp eyes. Where have you been? I've been exploring. I fell into some kind of pit that was conceived by at least primitive intelligence. Primitive savagery, too. What happened? I awoke at dawn. Challenger and Summerley were just getting up. Haven't even started arguing yet when it rained ape men. Dozens of them, thick as apples out of the trees. Didn't hear them gathering in the dark. I shot one through the belly, but before I knew it, they had us on the ground. They tied us up. They did fancy that, knowing how to tie knots. Did they hurt Elizabeth? Well, not exactly. Challenger told them right out loud he did kill us and be done with it. He told them, good thing they don't speak English. Then one of them, the biggest and ugliest, the leader, I guess, he put his paw on Challenger's shoulder and he looked him straight in the eye. They might have been cousins. Summerly was so nervous, she started to laugh. Then they set up to dragging us through the forest. Look at my clothes. Where are they now, west damn it? here, west of here. A village, if you can call it that. They tied us upside down, Summerly and me. How did you get away? It's the oddest thing. They treated us like dirt, but they took the challenger like he was some sort of long-lost relative. They gave him fruit and berries. When the ape men weren't looking, challenger was good enough to slip something to us. Early this morning, I got free and ran like hell to get the weapons. Were well, you followed? Oh, it's hard to say. Malone, you've got to believe this. The lost world is inhabited not only by ape men, but also by Indians. There's some sort of tribal war going on between them. While we were there, the ape men brought a dozen Indians to the village as prisoners, bitten and clawed so bad they could barely walk. This morning, they put two of them to death by pulling their arms off. Oh, my God. You know that patch of bamboo we saw at the base of the plateau? With the sharpened points. Well, it's right under the village. The apes throw their prisoners over the edge. That's why there are so many skeletons below. They even made us look. The bamboo had gone through the Indians like knitting needles through a pad of butter. They've saved a half dozen poor souls for later, plus the professor. 
You mean Elizabeth? Take heart, Malone. She's alive for now, and if we hurry, she'll still be so when we get there. What can we do? Just the two of us. Two of us? And guns. Look, they're masters of the trees. But in the open, we have a fighting chance. Now stick to the clearing and always, always have your rifle ready. Right, right. Don't let them take you prisoner. If you have so much as a single cartridge left. Now let's go. And pray to God we're not too late. <coughs> Mr. McConnell, message just arrived from Mr. Malone. Give it here, boy. Give it here. And back to your duties. Oh, yes, sir. Right away. What? This is fantastic. Unheard of. All right, stop the presses. Stand by for a special edition. Malone's done it again. Dear Mr. McArdle, as I relate these events, I know that cannot possibly make sense. Yet they're completely true and all the more horrifying for it. It was a sight I shall never forget to my dying day. Imagine a small village of primitive huts and the entire ape-man population gathered in a semicircle near the edge of the plateau. Within the circle were six Indians, as well as Somali and Challenger. The ape men jumping up and down, working themselves into a ceremonial frenzy. What filth! We could smell them from our hiding place in the bush some 50 yards away. Imagine, if you will, Professor Challenger positioned in the middle of the circle with the king of the apes. They were the same height, shared the same red color, and to our astonishment, seemed to be getting along, famously. And then, almost casually, the ape king raised his hand. <laughs> Suddenly, two of the apes seized one of the Indians. This Caesar of the jungle now turned to his people and asked whether the captive should be saved or thrown over the edge. Like in the Colosseums of old, the Indians' fate was sealed with a mighty cheer from the crowd. The ape men then took hold of the Indian by his legs and arms and swung him three times back and forth with tremendous force, and then, with a frightful heave, they flung the poor wretch over the precipice. <laughs> the deed done, the throng fell to the ground in paroxysms of laughter. Bloody savages. Is that what they did to the others? Yes, under the bamboo, skewered to death. We've got to start shooting now. How good a shot are you, boy? Not good enough. Then leave this business to me. After my first shot, fire at will. Ready? Ready. You killed the king! We start at the top. Now they're in disarray. Fire and keep firing, man. <laughs> Just as I thought. They've never seen guns before. They're scattering. Elizabeth, challenger, over here! Run! Hurry up! Run! This way! Damn it, this is over. Hurry, hurry! We've got to get back to the camp before right. they regroup. Hello, hello, who's this lookout? No! No, don't shoot him, Roxon. He was one of the Indian captives. He may be of help to us. Well, he certainly seems grateful from his smile. I'd venture to say the day is ours. He wants us all to follow him. You speak his language? Enough to understand it roughly. It's a variation on several Amazon dialects. He's pointing to the side of the plateau. Well, let's follow him then. On my word, Mr. Malone, I hope you're keeping an account of this in a diary. It could serve you well in your retirement. He wants us to keep up with him and his party. Notice how he and his men are staying in the clearing. Smart. Yes, they are. But the ape men are powerful. I have an observation to make. This plateau is at a crossroads of evolution, just as the rest of the world was eons ago. We see before us a struggle between man and ape. Our world went in a direction which led to us. This world has not made that decision as yet. If this tribal war leads to a different outcome than fate handed us... My God! 
think of what that would mean to the future of our species. Oh, listen to this, listen to this. Uh, from what little bits I've been able to gather, these people, they call themselves the Akala tribe, they come and go at will from the flatlands below. What's that he saying? Our friend has sent one of his scouts ahead to gather water. Do you understand what I said? There's a way out. You mean there is a passage? Jealously guarded, it is too. Clearly their enemy, the ape men, don't have use of it. <laughs> What's happened? It came from the brook. Stay here. Not on your life. Oh, good God. Look at that Indian's neck. It's turned all the way around. What happened to... Oh, horrible. It's the ape man's handiwork. They've been tracking us. God, we God, a day. He said... You don't have to speak the language to know how he oh. feels. We gave the dead Indian a perfunctory burial. Our new friend spoke a chant over his fallen kinsmen, and we continued on our way. It struck us as noteworthy that our leader refused to carry anything, leaving that task to his two remaining companions. Uh. Elizabeth, keep close. How are you doing? Tired, but I'll manage. I was worried about you. When Roxton said that you'd been taken, I feared the worst. And I was worried about you too, Ned. But I've learned from experience to deal with the worst. What experience do you mean? I was part of the Tasmanian expedition. Oh, my God, you were? Yes, there were 20,000 of them, you know. It was my first field research. I was with a team of seven scientists looking for any vestige of the fabled Tasmanians. I didn't know. Oh, those simple, peaceful people wore no clothes. Only grease and feathers. They'd never heard of fire and wanted nothing beyond what grew around them and little of that. One day, a band of them was chasing kangaroos, and the local British outpost thought they were attacking. The troops opened fire with guns and cannons against rocks and sticks. The army eventually exterminated nearly all of them. Our expedition was to try to find the last remaining few. However, by the time we arrived, they had learned to make weapons to fight and to trust no one. Four of my party died at their hands. Three of us were allowed to escape. Why? We shall never know. Perhaps it was to tell this story. What a brave woman you are, Elizabeth. Why, thank you, Ned. I was hoping you'd notice. In a few hours, we found ourselves at the far side of the plateau. We had arrived at the Indian village. Whereas the ape men lived in crude mud huts, the Indians dwelled in caves. My first impression was how clean and orderly their settlement was, certainly in comparison to the stench of the ape men village. What do you make of them, Samali? Rather advanced at this end of the plateau, eh? This is more than an encampment, it's a small town. There must be 200 people here. Look, they're coming to greet us. Oh, we must be the first white men they've ever seen. Yes, this could be a pivotal moment in their civilization. Why, we can show them... Oh, no, no, look. They're, they seem to be paying more attention to our friend. They're bowing at his feet. He must be their chief. See how he's calling them together. More like rallying the troops for battle, I'd say. Well, whatever he said worked. They're picking up their clubs and their pikes. And running back towards ape time. Yes, but little good will it do them. Clubs against clubs, rocks against rocks. What they need is guns. Oh, this is their fight, not ours. Come on, Challenger, what do you say? Our guns will tilt the balance in the Indians' favor. From what I've seen of the ape men, I say absolutely. We fight. What about you, Samali? You mean exterminate an entire people? Oh, they're not people. They don't have any respect for human life. Let's kill them all if that's what it takes. By what moral authority? By the authority of survival. Those eight men have every right to survive, too. What makes the Indians better than they are? Evolution! Are you quoting Darwin or Weissman? I'm quoting Challenger! We seem to have drifted very far from the objectives of our expedition. It's us or them, Samali. I'm sure they feel the same way. If we don't help Elizabeth, we shall never get off this plateau. 
There is no other way out. Well, then God forgive us all. Well, then it's settled. Let's go. We hurriedly joined forces with the Indians and managed to cross the plateau before nightfall. By dawn the next morning, we were in position and allied with the Indians. Ready. Aim. Fire! A wild clamour of shock and fear arose from the eight-man village. Those that fled from their huts were cut down. Others were set upon by gangs of Indians who exacted a long overdue revenge with their clubs. The chief led his men well, and we formed an ever-tightening semicircle around the eighth village. No one was spared. Malone! There are a bunch of them trying to break through the line. Got them! Set the huts on fire now! Smoke them out! They've never seen fire before. Move in! Move them toward the cliffs! Oh my god, that one's on fire. Put it out of its misery. That's got it! All right, form a line and close in. Form a line and close in. And toward the rest of us. Push them to the edge. They're catching on. They know what we're doing. It's about time. It serves them right. All right, close in! Close in, everybody! Roxton! Right. Four of them are by the rocks, trying to escape. Don't let them get away. It was both thrilling and horrible. One by one, the eight men were cut down as they scurried across the ground or clambered for the safety of the trees. Roxton's plan worked with deadly effectiveness. We drove the ape men toward the edge of the plateau, the edge that they had so cruelly tossed the Indians over in the past. Now it was their turn to die. Now it was their turn to join their enemies impaled on the bamboo spike 600 feet below. Over the ape men went, like trash emptied from a garbage can. Some pushed by their own kind, some shot by us, and the rest jumping in defiant sacrifice. This is phenomenal. Do you believe what you're hearing, lad? Wow, in all my years in the newspaper business, that's the best story I ever heard. And it gets better. All the feuds of countless generations, all the hatreds and cruelties, all the memories of persecution were purged that day. Not one ape man got away. Alas, it was a necessary slaughter. Great stuff, great. Hurry, get this down to typeset. Right away, sir. Faster than right away. I want it by yesterday. Don't you see what this means? Man has triumphed. The war is over for the lost world. Extra, extra, extermination of ape men makes lost worlds safe for humanity. Extra, extra. Well, it's done. Some of the Indians, they're still looting the ape men hearts. Look at them. Yeah, spoils of war, you know. Oh, my God. What have we done? Oh. What have we done? What we had to do. Perhaps the less we see of it, the better we shall sleep tonight. On the contrary, we have been privileged. Privileged? Yes, to be present at one of the decisive battles in history. We here today dedicate this plateau to humans. Professor, I think it's time we turned our energies towards escaping this plateau. Mm -hmm, yes. Uh, Malone, I've been thinking about something else. Yes? I understand that Roxton has been comparing me to that ape king. Oh, not exactly. I need not say that any publicity given to such an idea, any levity in your narrative, would be exceedingly offensive to me. I shall keep well within the truth. That is my concern. Uh, Professor, the young chief whose life we saved has decided to favor us with a gift. Here it is. A piece of tree bark. Turn it over. Look at it closely. It's a series of lines, like stick figures. Is this some kind of native artwork? It shows 18 marks all in a row. One of them has an X below it. If you look over there at the cliffs, you will see 18 cave openings. You've lost me, Samuel. I think it's a diagram of the caves, and the one with the X must be the one that leads down. down. Well, what are we waiting for? Nothing I can think of. 
Splendid. Uh, Malone, uh, you get Roxton. He's doing me a favor over at the rookery. We still have time to set up before we lose daylight. Yes. Roxton! Roxton! Shh. Where are you? Oh, 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 there you are. I I'm here to fetch you. The chief has shown his gratitude by pointing us the way out. Yeah. As soon as we gather our... Well, what are you? what are you doing? I'm visiting my friends. This is the pterodactyl rookery. Interesting beasts, don't you think? Damned unsociable, though, hate strangers. Whatever could you want in this deplorable bug? Oh, this and that. I'm collecting a young chick for Challenger, one that hasn't grown claws or teeth yet. Call it a pet, call it a souvenir, but don't call it anything until we get home. Uh, well, we're headed there as soon as you can join us. Uh, yes, well, I'll be along directly, and remember, not a word about this creature. The professor intends it as a surprise. As you wish. Two hours later, we were at the mouth of the cave opening, barely 20 feet into the tunnel. We felt a hot updraft, which confirmed that we had found our escape. Burdened with our possessions, we painstakingly pushed and pulled them through the contorted passageway. Naturally, Challenger regarded everyone else's belongings as expendable and put the most, most effort into, into preserving his own. Predictably, his were also the most cumbersome. After many a twist and turn in these ancient shafts, we found ourselves, thankfully, back at the base of the plateau. Many mementos, each providing yet another fragment of proof, had to be left behind. Besides, we were eager to take the canoes downriver to Manaus, board the ocean liner, and make the Atlantic crossing back to England and whatever welcome we might expect at home. <laughs> Welcome home, laddie. Welcome home, and a triumphant welcome it is. All London is here to greet you, and your final installment will be on the streets any minute. Wonderful. It's just wonderful. Gather your group and come with me. We have a fleet of carriages waiting to take you to the Zoological Society. This night, history will be written, and you, my boy, will have the byline. Yes, uh, la ladies and gentlemen, yes. The world has been waiting the return of the Zoological Society's expedition to the Lost World. If you would all take your seats, we can begin Professor Challenger's account. Now, everyone take your seats. Take your seat. You sit down there now. Come, take your seats. This way, Ned, this way. They're waiting for us in front. Uh, who ever expected crowds this size, Elizabeth? Excuse me. Excuse let, me. Look, let us pass, Excuse please. Ned. Excuse me. Oh, Ned. Ned. There you are, and look at you. Oh, hello, Gladys. What brings you here? Why, you do, of course. I've been following your adventures in the newspaper, and so have all my friends. They hang on every word you write. Why, thank you. May I oh, introduce... Oh, so green with envy. And you know what I do? I tell them, oh, that's just Ned Malone. We're engaged, you know. It makes them even greener. So, Gladys... What have you been doing with yourself while I've been away at the Amazon hunting dinosaurs? Any good dinner parties? Uh, 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 I've been cutting out your stories. They're in a scrapbook, which I just happened to leave in the parlour for callers to see. Oh, does this mean that I've uh, fulfilled your hopes, Gladys? That I've accomplished the impossible and I've made my place in the world? Oh, yes, Ned, it does. You've exceeded even my wildest dreams. <laughs> And, and now, at long last, I'm proud to say that I'm yours. Oh, you have no idea how happy that makes me. Uh, but first... I'm so glad, uh, because you... Gladys, said, uh, please. Yes. May I present Professor Elizabeth Summerley Malone. How do you do, Miss Hungerton? How do you do, Professor Summerley? Ah. Uh, I think you missed the point, Gladys. <laughs> this is Mrs. Malone. I beg your pardon? Elizabeth and I were married on the way back to England by the ship's captain, as a matter of fact. After our adventure together, we wanted to return home as husband and wife. Ned told me so much about you after we were married, of course. He's a wonderful man. What a pity you didn't snatch him up long ago. But, Ned, I, I thought that... <laughs> I mean, I mean, what... Oh, oh I wish you wouldn't, Gladys. <laughs> Things are much nicer as they are now. Oh, really? 
Oh, yes. Friendship is so pleasant. But so nice to meet you, Miss Hungerton. Come, Ned. Illingworth is about to start. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, yes, we have all read the news. Yes, yes, we have, we have all read the newspaper accounts of the lost world with excitement and skepticism. I believe tonight's debate shall be a colourful one, as are all exchanges between Professor Challenger and Illingworth on this and any other subject. <clears throat> I now present to you Professor Emil Illingworth. Thank you, Dr. Meldrum. Yes. Thank you, thank you. While it may be true that all of England has become entranced by the accounts of the lost world, I feel obligated to remind our audience that Professor Challenger broke his word to us and put the credibility of this expedition in jeopardy. We are no further along than we were two months ago when he spouted his nonsense about living dinosaur. Yes. Yes. With this in mind, I now hand over the podium to Professor Challenger and encourage him this time to provide us with facts rather than fiction. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I did not risk my life in the Amazon to face your hostility, Illingworth. When we first scaled the plateau, we encountered a brontosaurus. <laughs> this was attacked within moments by a megalodon. <laughs> I can tell you by first-hand experience that all of our theories about the vestigial nature of the megalodon's forearms may now be considered erroneous. <laughs> the beast was able to grasp the neck of the brontosaurus. Oh, fruit, man. Give us fruit! Hear me out first. Insects as big as your hand. Pterodactyls living as birds rather than lizards. <laughs> Challenger, your, your tales are captivating, but in this instance, I must agree with Ellingworth. You have submitted no evidence of your assertions other than a meager offering of fern leaves, soil samples, and a few bones of dubious origin. <laughs> Not to mention a piece of bark with a child scribbling on it. Yes, we want proof. Scientific proof. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, you do, do you? Well, then what would you accept as proof? An ape man, perhaps. If you would provide it. A dinosaur. <laughs> come, come, challenge you now. Get a grip on yourself, man. Something you could stake your professional reputations on, my little yes, colleagues. Yes, indeed. In that event, my soon to be discredited friends, I call upon Professor Malone, hitherto known to us as Professor Summerley, her lucky husband, Ed Malone, and Lord John Roxton. Would you please join me at the podium? Where are they? Oh, uh, here we are, Professor. Uh, gangway, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, here we are. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, gather round me. Gather round me. Yes. There. Yes, here we are. Are we prepared to educate the Philistines? Oh, we certainly oh, yes. are. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Mm -hmm. As the audience can plainly see, my fellow adventurers have brought with them this large covered cage. Before I remove the shroud, I ask the audience for silence. For your own personal safety, absolute silence. No loud noises, please. Quiet now. And now, without any further ado, I present to you a specimen that, according to Professor Illingworth, has been dead for tens of millions of years, but which tonight you will see is very much alive. Ladies and gentlemen, a living pterodactyl. <laughs> Is there enough proof for you, anyone? Anyway? Look, have them be quiet, Professor. The creature's straining yes. at its tail. Oh, no, it's yes. biting through its cage. Please, quiet down, everyone. Oh, no. Please, quiet down. It's bending the bars oh, of the no, cage now. Give me the shroud. Oh, Give me the shroud. Yes. Yes. Oh, no. Do something, Do something, Rustin. Can't you control it? Don't panic. The animal is more scared than you are. Stop, Stop. Stop. It's heading for the window. Oh, no. Stop, Stop it. It's yeah. heading for the window. Oh, no. Here's to all of us. 
of all who dared journey to the lost world and came back alive. I don't know which was worse, the pack of ape men or Illingworth. Assuming there's a difference. <laughs> How many times up the Amazon did you think of being at a pub like this, Malone? Well, the thought had occurred to me. Or were you too busy thinking of Professor Summerlee? Sorry, I mean Professor Malone. You'll get used to it, Lord John. Of course I will. Now, there's something I want to discuss with you. Sort of a private business. A private? In a pub? Best place to keep secrets is in public, I always say. I want to show you something. Look here, in this cigar box. What are they? Marbles? No, oh, where's your eyesight, you three? Marbles? These are precious stones, diamonds, emeralds, rubies. I've just had them appraised, and they made me an offer that I think I could split four ways and still be rich. Where did you get them? Well, you remember when you had me capture you a pterodactyl chick? Yes? I've only seen one other place in the world with a volcanic vent of blue clay like that. It was in the De Beers diamond mine. When I went to get your pterodactyl, I also fished out a fortune. How much are they worth? 200,000 pounds <gasps> minimum. Really? That's 50,000 for each of us. I feel that's only fair. 50,000? Oh. With that, I could finance a private museum. Now, what about you, Malone? Me? No. The pretty Malone. <laughs> I'd retire from teaching and devote my life to research. I'll tell you what I'm going to do with it. I'm going to have another go at the old plateau. <gasps> Very clever, Yes, yes and I suppose you'll <laughs> use yours to raise a family, Malone, um, huh? Not just yet. Uh, I think if you will have me, that I would rather go back with you. Really? If a certain party would agree to join me. Oh, why, Mr. Malone... What party did you have in mind? <laughs> <laughs> extra, extra strange bird flies over Rio de Janeiro. Scientists identify it as a pater, a pater, a pot. It's a big storm. Extra, extra, only in the Daily Gazette. Extra, extra, read on. Lost World by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was directed by Leonard Nimoy from a script co-written by Nat Segaloff and John DeLancey. The cast, in alphabetical order, included John DeLancey, Roxanne Dawson, Richard Doyle, Marnie Moseman, Leonard Nimoy, Ethan Phillips, Dwight Schultz, and Armin Shimmerman. Original music was composed and performed by Peter Erskine and recorded at Puck Productions in Santa Monica, California. Production sound was by David Brow with Tom Bennett and Diane Brow as associates. Stage manager, Mary Valenti, Foley artist, Michael Spira, post-production supervisor, Jeff Howell, post-production engineer, Gina Gutierrez. The Lost World was produced by Alien Voices, incorporated for Simon & Schuster Audio. This is Leonard Nimoy. Thank you.